immigration. The system that brought you me. But it's still good, and I promise that won't happen again. <laughs> Immigration has been dominating the news all week long as a caravan of migrants from Central America continues to head north. And despite it being a thousand miles and possibly months away, Trump has made it a centerpiece of his closing argument heading into the midterms. At this very moment, large, well organized caravans of migrants are marching toward our southern border. Some people call it an invasion. It's like an invasion. A lot of young men, strong men, and a lot of men that maybe we don't want in our country. I don't want them in our country. And women don't want them in our country. Women want security. Men don't want them in our country, but the women do not want them. Women want security. Wow. <laughs> Young, strong men are invading our country and coming from our women. That is such old-timey racism. I'm genuinely amazed that image didn't automatically turn black and white as he talked, <laughs> like Pleasantville in reverse. Now, this week, Trump has been threatening immigration actions ranging from sending 15,000 troops to the border to ending birthright citizenship. And look, it is hard to know what the president will or even can do going forward. So tonight, instead of focusing on hypotheticals, I thought it might be useful to look backwards at something he absolutely did do concerning immigrants, family separation. It was part of his zero-tolerance policy, where parents crossing the border were locked up, prosecuted, and had their children taken away. The story dominated the news back in June with distressing images of kids in cages and shelters, Melania's very cool jackets reading, I really don't care, do you? And, of course, this moment. I read today about a 10-year-old uh, girl with Down syndrome who was taken from her mother and put in a cage. Wah, wah. I read about a, a... Did you say want want to a 10-year-old with Down syndrome? Yes, he did. Yes. Yeah, Corey Lewandowski said, womp, womp. And if there is any justice, that will be carved on his gravestone. And when he arrives at the pearly gates, the first thing he'll hear will be, oh, hi, Corey. I've been waiting a long time to say this to you. <clears throat> womp, womp. <laughs> now, after, after a national outcry and court challenges, the president signed an order reversing course, and the story kind of faded from the headlines. But it is really worth revisiting, because a number of government reports recently came out, giving us a much clearer picture of what was actually happening. And while it seemed malicious and chaotic at the time, at every step, it was even worse than you might assume. So let's look at two major aspects of family separation, how it was done and why. And let's start with the how, because you may remember heartbreaking stories of parents unsure where their children had been taken. But when Alex Azar, Secretary of Health and Human Services, was asked about this, he reassured everyone that there was nothing to worry about. There is no reason why any parent would not know where their child is located. I could, at the stroke of... at, the, at keystrokes, I've sat on the ORR portal with, with just basic keystrokes within seconds could find any child in our care for any parent. You know, it's not every day that you see a man testify with the goal of convincing people he has access to a lot of kids on his computer. <laughs> Seriously, guys, just a few taps on the old keyboard and it's Kid City on this thing. <laughs> Pretty much the second I open my computer, boom, I'm up to my neck in children. And yes, I heard how that sounds, and you know what? I like it. <laughs> But while Azar may have known where the kids in his custody were, that was only one piece of the puzzle. The critical information that allowed kids to be matched with parents was compiled by a different department, Homeland Security. And an Inspector General report found that their data was not just incomplete and inconsistent, but that each step of this process was vulnerable to human error, increasing the risk that a child could be lost in the system, which is terrible. You should be able to lose children in a government system as easily as in a Chuck E. Cheese ball pit. I'm sorry, we're going to have to call off the search, Mrs Donaldson. Ralphie's lost to the balls now. <laughs> In fact, while we've been told that the government separated around 2,600 children and that around 220 kids are still being held away from their parents, we actually can't say for sure whether either of those numbers are accurate. Just two weeks ago, the government apparently found 14 more children and added them to its tally. And just think about that. 14 children were missing and we didn't even know it. How was that not a bigger story? When those 12 boys were stuck in a cave in Thailand, there were live cameras and Elon Musk was sending submersibles and calling rescuers pedophiles. Now, I'm not saying that's what I wanted to happen here. I didn't want it to happen then, but at least people were fucking paying attention. And all this incompetence should have been obvious, because when non-profits tried to check on the kids, the government often didn't have a good system to locate those that were listed as being present. We were given a list by the government, uh, and we were told that we could choose who we wanted to speak to, Looking through the list of over 500 names, I noticed that there were some very young children there. 
uh, including a two-year-old, several one-year-olds, and uh, one child that was listed as being zero. So I asked to see those children. They left and came back and said that they couldn't find the children. They said to me, well, we called out their name and nobody responded, so we don't know where they are. So I, I sort of said, well, These were babies. they're babies. They're babies. Obviously, they're not going to respond to their name being called. OK. <laughs> Anyone who calls a baby's name and then gives up on finding them either knows nothing about babies or is covering for a baby who doesn't actually want to be reached. <laughs> sorry, sorry, just tell them I'm not in today. I'm up to my diaper and triangles over here. And I've got a 2.30 meeting with my own toes to prep for Mondays. Am I right? <laughs> Seriously, am I right? I don't know the days of the week. I am, after all, a fucking baby. <laughs> And, and even with, even with the help of non-profits in locating and reuniting parents, hundreds of whom, incidentally, were actually deported without their children, the government still had fuck-ups. Like when one mother who'd had her five-month-old breastfeeding baby taken away was later handed back the wrong baby. And just imagine thinking you're about to be reunited with your child after being forced apart and being given someone else's shitty baby. <laughs> I say this as a parent. My infant is a miracle and a joy. Anyone else's is a charmless snot monster. <laughs> Get it away from me. <laughs> so, to put it mildly, when it comes to how did we do this, the answer seems to be a combination of incompetently and cruelly. Which brings us to the other big question, why? Why did we do this? Well, some in the Trump administration argue that they simply had no choice. Are you intending for this to play out as it is playing out? Are you intending for parents to be separated from their children? Are you intending to send a message? I, I find that offensive. Why? No, because why, why would I ever create a policy that purposely does that? Perhaps it's a deterrent. No. No! A deterrent? I would never! You offend me, sir! Here's the thing about this administration. You can always tell you've figured out exactly what they're doing when they get offended by your description of what they might be doing. <laughs> It's a pretty obvious tell. It's like a poker player ejaculating every time they have a good hand. <laughs> OK, I think we all see what's happening here. <laughs> now, often, the official line was that family separations were not a deterrent, they were simply a consequence of having to enforce the law, as the then acting head of ICE, Thomas Homan, explained at the time. Every law enforcement agency in this country separates parents from children when they're arrested for a crime. We are a law enforcement agency. We are enforcing the criminal laws. I don't blame anybody if you want to be the greatest country on earth, being a part of this greatest country on earth, which we all are. But there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. OK, it's pretty hard to listen to someone say we're the greatest country on earth while simultaneously justifying why we're unnecessarily ripping kids away from their parents, especially when that person looks like what would happen if a can of monster energy drink fucked John Lithgow. <laughs> but... <laughs> but look, a few things there regarding the right way, because... First, many of these people were applying for asylum, meaning they're seeking protection from persecution. And under international and US law, it is legal to apply for that, no matter how you enter the country. Second, while the Trump administration insisted that the right way for asylum seekers to come in was through a port of entry, like an official border crossing, they made it far more difficult to do that, with many being repeatedly denied entry into the country and forced to wait days or even weeks. And you can't just arbitrarily delay people that long. There are asylum seekers looking for safety, not AT&T customers trying to speak to a representative. Representative. That's right. I've got your business, Daddy. I've got you so good. What are you going to do about it? I'm right here. Now, and finally, finally, crossing the border in the wrong way is actually only a misdemeanor on first offence. In fact, most people are usually just sentenced to time served. And that's the thing here. Contrary to what you might think, most of the parents who were separated from their kids were charged, pled guilty, and served their sentence all fairly quickly. Now, in the past, we generally didn't prosecute parents and even let many of them go free, awaiting their immigration hearing, which makes sense. So, why did we suddenly start keeping people who had already served their time locked up and away from their kids? Well, because Trump hated the old system. He called it catch and release, and he described it in wildly misleading terms. We catch a criminal, a real criminal, a rough, tough criminal. We take his name and then we release him. Right. And we say, please show up to court in a couple of months. You know what the chances of getting him to court are? Like zero, OK? Right. Now, deep down, when Trump said the number zero, you just instinctively knew that no matter what the number was, it was definitely not zero, right? 
Because if he says something's hot, it's cold. If he says something's up, it's down. If he said, this is a cute puppy, you'd automatically think, I'm not sure why or how, but that puppy is definitely a fucking asshole. <laughs> And, and when it comes to families seeking asylum, who, remember, were the ones largely impacted by family separation, the number is ridiculously far from zero, because 96% of them turned up to court after being released from detention. And under an Obama administration program called Family Case Management, where each family was assigned a case manager who then helped them navigate the system, 99.3% attended their hearing. So Trump was wrong. He was 99.3% wrong. <laughs> And you know what that means. We got it! We got it! Now, you're probably expecting the tiger to come out now, but sadly, he died of sadness several months ago. So, all this button now does is increase my morphine drip. So, yeah. It just, uh... It numbs the pain. It's not perfect, but it helps. See you later. Now, Trump discontinued that case management program, despite the fact that even ICE called it an overall success and went with ripping families apart instead. So, for the final time, why? If they'd already paid the price for their crime and there were other, better ways to ensure that they showed up for court, why the everlasting fuck did we really do this? Well, I would argue that this is the logical result of a general hard right turn toward demonising immigrants for political advantage in a way that some might call racist and others would be wrong about. Now, conservative <laughs> immigration arguments essentially now follow a pretty clear pattern. Crossing the border is a crime, therefore anyone crossing it is a criminal, and since all criminals are dangerous, anyone crossing the border is a dangerous criminal. Never mind the fact that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than people born here, that has simply not stopped Republicans from running toxic anti-immigrant, anti-caravan political ads like these. A young woman gunned down by an illegal immigrant who should have been deported. Illegal aliens invade America. Democrats who stand in our way will be complicit in every murder committed by illegal immigrants. Mexican drug lords, MS-13 gang members, sex traffickers. MS-13, violent gang members. Gang members, known criminals, people from the Middle East. Holy shit! You know that's racist, cos they just gave up any pretense of specific fear-mongering and simply said, people from the Middle East. <laughs> At that point, why not go all in and just start naming groups you hate? The caravan also contains Planned Parenthood, <laughs> gays who want wedding cakes, <laughs> Black Santa and a 30-foot Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Democrats will be complicit in every person the giant Pelosi eats. <laughs> nom, 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 nom. Nom, 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 nom. And if you watch enough of those ads, you realise it's not that they don't want immigrants to come here because they're criminals, it's that they're calling them criminals because they don't want them to come here. And to see that in action, just watch this exchange that CNN had with a New Jersey Trump supporter. So you're worried about immigration? Only coming in the illegal way. Not the legal way. Come in the legal way and you are more than welcome. I mean, it is legal to seek asylum. Well, I hope Trump changes that. You don't want any asylum seekers? No. You know, it's simply not often that you see someone's cover story fall apart with so little pushing. <laughs> are you three kids wearing a trench coat? No. Do you want some ice cream? Yes, there are three of us and we all like chocolate. <laughs> we, we are... We're now so accustomed to seeing immigrants as a threat that politicians routinely talk about them in the language of war. Remember, Trump referred to the caravan as an invasion and sent troops to the border. And that kind of militaristic talk can make people think that it is necessary to make the kind of impossible choices made during a war, which is how things like family separation happen. Just watch as Jessica Vaughan of an anti-immigration think tank tries to justify what we did. A lot of Americans find it appalling. What do you say to them? I think it's appalling that we have to do it. What do you think the consequences are for these children that have gone through, that are still going through this trauma? I, I think it's very possible that some of these kids will, will have some lasting effects. Right. But lasting damage to children is a huge consequence. You're separating them from their parents, not telling them you ate all their Halloween candy to get on Jimmy fucking Kimmel. <laughs> and, and while we're on that topic, no one should do that. I mean, I'm really glad that some people do, cos it's extremely funny, <laughs> but nobody should, but please keep doing it. And, <laughs> and, and while she acknowledges 
that what we're doing is appalling. She says, we have to do it. But the truth is, we don't. We don't have to do any of it. Because even though the language of war is being used, there is not a war. And the only reason people keep talking like there is one is to give themselves permission to make the choices they want to be forced to make. But family separation cannot be one of them. Because, as she says, these kids will have some lasting effects. But while that's easy to say in the context of abstract paediatric science, the reality of it is fucking heartbreaking. Take Henry. He's a six-year-old from Honduras. He was separated from his mother and reunited after a month apart. But, as a documentary crew found, their ordeal was far from over. And I'm warning you, this is going to be rough to watch. Esta separación fue muy larga, mi hijo ya cambió mucho. Con tanto trauma. Ya no quiero ser tu hijo, ya no soy tu hijo, me dijo. Yeah. We did that. And not because we had to, but because we chose to. And horrifically, we may actually be about to do it again. Trump has publicly flirted with bringing back family separation, and Thomas Homan supported that idea during a recent interview with Fox and Friends, or, as it's known in the business, a face-to-face -face meeting with the president. But let me talk about the zero tolerance policy. That was the right thing to do. Regardless how sad and unfortunate it is, no one wants to see families separated, but when they separated those people that were prosecuted and entered the country illegally, the numbers went down 22% in just two weeks. If they would have stuck with that for 30, 60 days, there wouldn't be a caravan today. Yeah. Maybe, Tom. And you know what? If we surrounded the border with randomly firing flamethrowers and snakes <laughs> that we trained to stand up whenever anyone approached, that could potentially drive the caravan away too. But we don't do things like that because it's not supposed to be who we fucking are. <laughs> and I say that, I say that, I say that fully and painfully aware. But if Trump hears that idea coming out of a television, he may well go, someone write that down, snakes and flamethrowers, that's a great idea, I had it, that's my idea. <laughs> So, look, look, if the president really wants to make Tuesday's election about him and about immigration, then, then fine. Let's make it about that. Because family separation is perhaps the most emblematic moment of his presidency so far. It was cruel, sloppy, needless, racist, and ultimately exactly what we should have expected. And I would argue the biggest threat to our status as the greatest nation on Earth is not a caravan a thousand miles south of us. It's whoever thinks that doing this is an acceptable fucking response.